Why Pakistan is dying? Is this a global problem? Pakistan has been experiencing an economic crisis as part of the 2022 political unrest. It has caused severe economic challenges for months due to which food, gas and oil prices have risen. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has caused fuel prices to rise worldwide. And the excessive external borrowings by the country over the years raised the specter of default, causing the currency to fall and making imports more expensive in relative terms. By June 2022, inflation was at an all-time high. Along with rising food prices, Poor governance coupled with low productivity per capita in comparison with other low to middle income developing countries have contributed to a balance of payment crisis, where the country is unable to earn enough foreign exchange to fund the imports that it consumes. Besides just that, the dying nation will exacerbate other more problems like the rise of more nuclear weapons and wars that will affect global peace. So, why is Pakistan dying? and would it recover from such a slow death? Join us today as unravel the sad truths behind Pakistan's falling economy. It is slowly becoming a waking reality for Pakistan as its import-dependent economy has run out of foreign exchange, causing food and energy shortages and resulting in economic hardship that is driving political radicalization and extremism. Such developments would be troubling anywhere. But for nuclear-armed Pakistan, domestic instability feeds into wider border disputes with India and Afghanistan, who may look to advance their territorial claims, and the consequent escalation could destabilize South Asia, potentially dragging the world with it. As the Wisens will say, to create a nation's money is to control its destiny. In 1835, the British Empire established a uniform currency for colonial India, seeking to reap the benefit of senior age and control the means of paying taxes and crucial debts. Since Pakistan gained independence in 1947, there has been little change in its circumstance. However, the fate of its 230 million citizens hinges on foreign currency for importing essential goods like food, energy and fertilizers. Over the years, Pakistan has experienced more outflows of foreign exchange than inflows, leading Islamabad to consistently face fiscal and current account deficits. In 2022, the situation worsened significantly. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, global commodity prices surged, putting pressure on Pakistan's foreign exchange reserves. Subsequently, massive flooding along the Indus River submerged one-third of the country, devastating both subsistence farms and export crops. This dual catastrophe heightened Pakistan's reliance on imports while depriving it of export earnings, resulting in an additional $15 billion repair bill, equivalent to approximately 4% of the GDP. By January 2023, Pakistan's currency reserves were only adequate to cover several weeks of imports. In response, Islamabad implemented measures such as power rationing, increased tariffs on energy, and delayed shipments of food and raw materials at port. While these actions curbed the outflow of payments, they also led to production cuts and a decline in industrial output. The textile industry, which contributes significantly to Pakistan's GDP and employment, accounting for one-tenth and two-fifths, respectively, laid off seven million workers. Additionally, rising gas bills for factories increased production costs, rendering local products less competitive in global markets. Economic hardships have exacerbated political tensions both within Pakistan and with its creditors. Islamabad's current IMF program commenced in 2019 during Imran Khan's tenure as Prime Minister. A former cricket player, Khan was accustomed to dealing with spin, yet he struggled to reconcile his populist image with the IMF's stringent austerity measures. Ultimately, Khan was removed from office through a no-confidence vote, during which he vehemently criticized his political adversaries and exacerbated Pakistan's political turmoil. Consequently, the crisis could compel Pakistan to adopt a market-determined exchange rate and discontinue energy subsidies, leading to increased inflation, reduced consumption, and potentially triggering a recession. However, these measures might further polarize a society where the rising cost of living is beginning to outweigh economic benefits. With limited democratic channels available, there has been a surge in military. 
extremist attacks rose by 27% in 2022, culminating in one of the deadliest attacks ever in the country at Peshawar Mosque in January of this year. Furthermore, jihadism in Pakistan is closely tied to territorial disputes. Both the Pakistan and Afghan Taliban reject the legitimacy of the Durand Line, a border established during the British colonial era that divides Pashtun territories. If Pakistan experiences internal destabilization, the Taliban could exploit national sentiments among Pakistan's 40 million ethnic Pashtuns, primarily located in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, to seek diplomatic recognition or greater autonomy for Pashtuns. Such events could ripple out to neighboring Balochistan, which has been plagued by separatist militants since 1948. Local separatist groups claimed the province is neglected and underdeveloped, and given its large hydrocarbon and gold reserves, a weakened central government may swell the ranks of separatist forces wishing to break away from Pakistan. If both the Pashtun and Balochi territories were to rebel, there wouldn't be much left of Pakistan. But the greatest threat to South Asian stability would be the status of Pakistan's nuclear arsenal. As of 2021, Islamabad was assessed to have 165 nuclear warheads, four plutonium production reactors, and expanded uranium enrichment infrastructure and new delivery systems in development. In a collapse scenario, non-state actors, rogue agencies, factions, or individuals would have ample scope to pilfer nuclear assets. Worse, they could be sold off if Pakistani weapons or nuclear technology fell into unscrupulous hands, and given the likely rise in separatist and jihadist militancy, there would be no shortage of political buyers. The collapse of Pakistan would thus proliferate the exponential rise of nuclear weapons worldwide. Besides that, there would be a rising tension between India and Pakistan, with the most likely flashpoint being Kashmir. In 1999, both states fought a war over the district of Kargil, and to this day, both sides monitor the regional balance of power carefully. In the current situation, should Pakistan lose its military capacity to a domestic crisis, India may be tempted to advance its interests across the line of control. And to add insult to injury, nuclear communications between the two states is equally poor. And for this reason alone, there would be a lot of miscommunication and miscalculation, and this would heighten the risk of nuclear confrontation, especially if New Delhi cannot ascertain which Pakistani policy organs have the authority to negotiate, or if Islamabad cannot reliably account for all its nuclear assets. In that case, the potential conflict could result in global consequences. Pakistan's crisis is therefore a very big problem for the world right now, and preventing a spiral of radicalization and instability means first solving the economic crisis, reducing military spending, pursuing economic diversification, and reducing import dependency. While this might help to an extent, it will not overpower what is currently felt in Pakistan. Foreign debt during the Cold War and the Afghan conflict, Pakistan's strategic significance led to substantial financial support from IMF and other Western institutions. But these loans exceeded Pakistan's ability to repay, compounded by their foreign currency domination. This situation holds profound implications for Pakistan's economy. While the country may evade immediate default, the long-term burden of its mounting $130 billion external debt looms large. As of 2023, the Pakistan's dollar-denominated obligations is $26 billion, which has done great damage in draining the foreign exchange that is needed for essential imports. Should they push Pakistani politics further into crisis, thus, the only viable solution left is if the creditors take haircuts, restructure the residual debt, postpone immediate interest payments, and ensure new capital flows. Otherwise, things will come crumbling down for Pakistan to even think of recovery. However, renegotiating debt comes with its own complexities, particularly given the geopolitical ramifications of Pakistan's external debt structure. Since 2014, the share owed to private mediators such as commercial banks and bank holders has increased significantly from 19% to 30%. 
these entities are primarily concerned with financial returns rather than international relations or Pakistan's well-being, which could complicate efforts to resolve Pakistan's debt burden. Meanwhile, Western-dominated multilateral creditors like the IMF, the World Bank, but also the Asian Development Bank, hold around one-third of Pakistan's external debt. But they maintain that the write-down would hurt their credit rating and thus their ability to discharge their functions. That leaves China holding the bag. Beijing stands as Islamabad's largest bilateral creditor, holding one-fifth of its external debt. This makes China Pakistan's best prospect for debt relief, as Pakistan could potentially negotiate a reduction directly. The nature of Chinese debt is also distinct, focusing on tangible infrastructure initiatives like the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, linking Xinjiang with Gwadar Port in Pakistan, to diversify trade routes away from the Malacca Strait. With substantial investments exceeding $65 billion in such projects, China has a vested interest in a stable Pakistan. The threat of jihadist influence spreading into Xinjiang further incentivizes Beijing to support Islamabad and potentially forgive or renegotiate debts rather than demand immediate repayment. Pakistan has been doubling its national debt roughly every five years over the last 25-year period. Starting from a debt of US $11 billion at the beginning of General Musharraf regime in 1999, the debt stood at US $220 billion at the end of the Imran Khan government in 2022. While the debt grew at around 14% per year on average, the GDP was growing at only 3% per year on average. Ultimately, Pakistan's crisis could quickly become everyone's problem, should it spiral out of control. The country is on the brink of economic and political collapse, and while Pakistan's nuclear arsenal makes it too big to fail, its foreign debt burden is too big for it to succeed. For the moment, creditors hold the whip helm, but soon they may consider to forgive some debts, not as an act of charity but as a concession to realism. The thing here is, if debt cannot be paid, it will never be paid. Thanks for watching this video. Please don't forget to subscribe and let's meet in our next episode.